Hello and welcome to Make It Super Assembly live from Abbey Community College in Monkstown. For today's Super Assembly, we are joined by one of the most recognisable faces in the country. He's going to be chatting to us about the setbacks he had to overcome to achieve his dream of being a BBC presenter and how hard work, persistence and resilience can help you succeed. Now, the multi-award winning TV and radio broadcaster. He keeps politicians in check and discusses the issues that matter to you. He's here on the second biggest show in the country. This is Stephen Nolan. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, that's, uh, that's, me, that's me clapping you for, for in, inviting me here. First of all, I'm sure you, you think I'm a lot less fat looking in real life, right? And TV. Um, I just, I just want to tell you my story and, and see what you think afterwards. And maybe, maybe some of you will have questions uh, for me, and I'd be, I'd be happy to, to answer them. So here's a, here's a bit of my background. Born above the Ballygamartin Road, both my mum and dad didn't have much money. In fact, I'm, I'm so proud of what my mother and father did for me because they worked around the clock. I remember my father at the end of the week having so little money that, that, that sometimes we couldn't go and do things as a family. And so I was, I was always kind of very aware that I was from one of those backgrounds in Northern Ireland where certainly money wasn't going to, to give me an advantage, all right, when I, was, when I was growing up. I loved school and I loved the, I loved the opportunity that a good school, and Mrs. Quinn has been telling me about this school, and it's a fantastic school and what you're achieving so far you should all be very, very proud of. And once you have a good school, then what I would advise you to do, because what I did is I grabbed it. And so what can you get out of that? The friends that you're making now, incredible. And like I'm, I'm out of school over 20 odd years now, out of over, what am I, I'm 44 now. I'm out of school a long, long time. And we still meet up and we still have a, have a laugh together. And that's, that's very important. So grab that and use that and keep your friendships. So, I got to kind of, I got to the stage where I was doing my exams and I was working really, really hard. Um, I remember in primary school, you know, thinking I was working very hard and then it was my 11 plus in the day, it was the transfer test, the big school, and I failed that test. I didn't pass that test. So that was a kind of another knockback to me. It was just a, a, an obstacle, one of the first obstacles in my life. That's the one I remember. And then I was a, a goalkeeper um, playing football for a very, very good team called uh, Bloomfield Youth. And I was kind of the fat kid that couldn't, I couldn't reach up and hit the crossbar. And I remember now, so this is coming back to me, I remember reaching up and trying to jump and all the other kids could jump and could touch the crossbar and I couldn't. And that inability for me to touch that crossbar has stayed with me 30 years later. Um, because I, 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 want, I knew that whatever... I wanted to achieve in life, I would have to fight for it, that it wasn't gonna come naturally to me. So I don't think I have any natural ability at anything I do in life. I don't think that I'm particularly good or better than other people at anything I do in life, but I'll tell you what I do think. Um, I have a determination that's probably more than thousands of people put together. So you see when there's a brick wall put in front of me, there's just something in me that says, I'm gonna knock that wall down. So there's nothing in me that thinks I'm better than anybody else, but there's something in me says, all right, you're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've failed my test. I'm too fat for this. I'm this, I'm that. Right, I'm, I'm going to still succeed. So then I, had a, then I had a dream, and this was when I was about 18, 19, not a physical dream, just this thing in me. I always wanted to work for the BBC. That's what I wanted to do. And I used to, I used to walk past the big building in, in Ormo Avenue. Uh, it's a massive big building. I used to look at it. If only I could, could work in there. And I, I listened to all the fantastic presenters on the radio, 
and that's what I wanted to do. And so I started writing letters to the BBC. Uh, and the vast majority of them, uh, they wrote back and said, no, uh, it's just not the right time, or we don't have any vacancies, or whatever. And so then I uh, applied for a traffic and travel job. And a traffic and travel job is, is essentially where, where you report on the traffic. And uh, I remember going for that interview in the BBC and the BBC telling me that I didn't have a voice for radio, which is interesting because I'm now on their, their, their station uh, nine shows a week. And so that was another knockback. And that was another, my goodness, I don't, so I don't have a voice for radio in the babe. Right. Okay, that's not good. And then I continued and continued with these letters and standing outside the BBC wanting to be in there. And a, a very senior producer, and this is many years ago, we're going back over a decade, and a very senior producer brought me into the BBC and showed me this email that, that someone had sent, that a senior person at the BBC had sent, um, which said, look, Stephen Nolan is essentially a bit of a stalker. Uh, you know, don't speak to him. He, he, he's, he's not, he's not he, he just doesn't have the ability. And I, I walked out of the BBC that day crying. So I was devastated um, because that was my dream over until I got home. And I thought to myself, do they think I'm not good enough? Are they actually building a, you know, the highest brick wall in front of me ever? Well, I'll show them. So, so what I did was there was a community radio station called BCR. Uh, none of these will, you will know about because you're all too young and I'm too old now. But BCR became City Beat Radio and City Beat Radio recently became Q Radio. You've probably heard of, of, of Q Radio. And I literally, and I'm telling you these stories just to show you the extent of the determination from someone who's no better than any of you, who's no better educated than any of you, but I've got more determination than some of you. So the BBC had rejected me. So I went to this community radio station and I approached the manager there. And the manager was a, a lovely guy called Mike Gaston, um, but he said, look, we've no vacancies. So every day, and I mean every day at five o'clock, when he walked out of that community radio station, I was standing there saying, are you sure there's nothing? Are you sure? And even if it was pouring rain, I stood there. I was, it, it probably was becoming weird, okay? And about four months later, he allowed me to come in and answer the phones. And once I got inside that organization, I tried everything I could to impress that organization. What could I do? So I was answering the phones, but I was also offering to, to make the tea. I was also offering, oh, you needed something recorded? I went and I did it. And I brought it back to them and they hadn't even asked. So he might, I might have overheard this. I went out and I did it and I brought it back to them. And so eventually they gave me a little show on BCR, this community radio station. And then I thought, well, what about this, this, this objective that I have to prove the BBC wrong? And so I found the biggest awards that there were in radio. They were in the UK, they were called the Sony Awards. And these were the, war the awards that the likes of Jonathan Ross, uh, Terry Wogan at the time, all those big Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 5 presenters were, uh, were winning. And what I did was I targeted winning one of those awards in order to say to the BBC, you don't want me. Because I knew the BBC went to those awards. Um, and it took me a couple of years, but I ended up in London, this wee Belfast kid in London, um, and I won three of them on, on the first year, uh, three gold awards. And what I would do is I would come up onto the stage and I would say to the BBC, I would say, because they would be there, and I would say, listen, I, I welcome my colleagues from the BBC, commiserations of not winning tonight, and I had the trophy in my hand. So three years later, this fantastic, incredible organization that is the BBC um, allowed me in the door. And, and what, what I have been trying to do after I got in the door ever since was I have been trying to say to them, 
first of all, thank you for letting me be part of it, but here's what I can do. And I've been working so hard, all right? And that, that drive to try to achieve something gets you so far, all right? It really does. So you see if there's any of you in this room today and you're kind of thinking to yourself, yeah, I, I've got a dream or I've got an ambition. I promise you that there's very few people will be so determined that they will stand in the rain like I did for four months in order to get into that first job. So if you're prepared to do something like that, if you're prepared to be the most determined person, here's the score. Very few other people are that determined, so you'll make it. I promise you you will. That's the secret. So don't think of yourselves as any better than anybody else. Don't think of yourselves as at any disadvantage because you don't have money. But do think to yourselves that you could be incredibly successful because you've got the determination. There might be one of you in the room. There might not be more than that. There might be 10 of you in the room, but who's going to actually do it? Now, I mentioned the word success there. What is success in life? I'll tell you now, success isn't a lot of money because I've got a lot of money and I don't consider myself successful. All right? Success in life is achieving what you want to do. Success in life is contentment and you kind of knowing that you are doing what you want to do in life. So don't get wrapped up in that either. Don't I know money and cars and big houses and all of that is, is what you kind of aspire to when you're your age. But I've got that. And what I actually did recently, I bought myself a nice car, but I came down from an expensive car to a less expensive, very nice car. All right? Just know that, that contentment is the most important thing. And you're at the age now where you can achieve that. You know, the prevailing message that I want to get through to you all today is have a sense of ambition, but a sense of opportunity in your lives that you, you've got time, you've got the advantage of time if it clicks into your mind now that you can do. So if you think about it, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? You've got the time to do it if you work out a strategy in your head and you're, you're prepared to be more determined than anyone else. Let, let me tell you about a couple of the other things because I don't want to ramble on today and what I would love to do today is hear from you. You'll be asking me questions and, and we talk to each other. I'll tell you the other thing that I, that I hate in Northern Ireland. I detest it and it's class and it's snobbery, okay? And it's people from kind of more sophisticated backgrounds thinking that they're better from, than people who are from working class estates or who don't have a lot of money behind them, all right? What you will find and what I've found in life is people from working class backgrounds, people from backgrounds where they've had the fight to earn their money, they're as good as anybody else in Northern Ireland and can work as good and can perform as good and can achieve as much. So I know that some of you might not be from the most affluent backgrounds in Northern Ireland. Neither am I, right? And I'm very proud of my roots. I'm very proud of the education I got, the school I got. I'm very proud of the friends I have. And all I can see around me is opportunity. One last thing, and then I'll listen from you. And this is quite important as well, I think. So I'm doing quite well in the BBC, all right? I'm presenting nine radio shows a week. Uh, I'm presenting something like 30, 40 odd television shows a year. Do I look like a TV presenter, okay? I'm fat, I'm quite disheveled. Uh, it's a miracle that there's not a stain down my shirt, okay? What am I trying to say to you? Don't, don't get sucked into this thing of, What's the conventional thing? What's the robotic the, the, that society is saying you have to look like or you have to sound like? Be yourself, because that's such an important message. Because you see, if you're yourself and you have confidence in who you are, then anybody who judges you, you just kind of look at them. So again, I've had people, how can he be on, and how can he be on telly at 20 stone? Well, I'm on telly at 20 stone, and they're some of the most watched programs in Northern Ireland. In other words, people accept you for who you are, so accept yourself for who you are. 
last thing for me, from me, and then we can ask each other questions, hopefully. There's a really important project for me over the next 18 months. I want to dedicate myself to it. And the project that I'm currently presenting is, is only one arm of that. This is another that, that, that I'm not driving. Other people in the BBC are, and they're doing a fantastic job. Look at this. And that is that the BBC has got a huge commitment, all right? A meaningful, huge, they really mean it, that we want to invest in you. And we want you to become a bigger voice in Northern Ireland society. So that does mean getting involved in politics. That does mean that if something's happening in your community, then interact with the BBC and put us under pressure to reflect what you want to be heard. Because I'm listening. I don't know if any of you have seen the Top Table show where we're now, I'm now putting you know, young people in, at the very top table in a massive studio to take the politicians on. But there are other projects. There's this. There are many other projects in the BBC where we are actively saying to you now, become part of the BBC in a bigger way and let your voice be heard. And you see, if anybody says to you, you're not old enough, you're not mature enough, you don't have a, a, a enough life experience, tell them to get stuffed, all right? Because you have a lot more to add to this society than some of the people who are slightly older who have been saying the same things for many years. So you've got a voice, we need to give you a platform, and I'm telling you something here today that that's what I want to do, so use it. Who's got the first question? Okay, can we get a big round of applause for Stephen first? Thank you. Thank you. So our first question is from Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Hello. I'd just like to ask you, what advice would you give to yourself at the age of 16 if you were doing your GCSEs again? Oh, that's a good question. All right, so I need to first of all remember back to was to, to, to I was 16. Um, to keep things in context, because I was a deep worrier, I did work hard. Like, I worked really, really hard for, for, for my GCSEs. But I worried myself sick about the what if of, what if I don't pass every one of these? What, 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 what if I don't get big grades in every one of these? Actually, with the, with the benefit of time, you realize that whatever happens at that moment, you, you can regroup and you can, you can rebuild. And so there's a, there's a lot of pressure in your age. You should work hard because they're important, like they're, they're, they're really important. But again, it's that, just that sense of the advantage that you have over me is time. So you're what? You're 15, 16? Well, I'm 18. You're 18. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> it's all the same to me once you go below 30, mate. Um, right, but, but you've got time. So don't worry yourself sick. Work hard, but understand that this is an incredible age group that you're in, because the world's your oyster, and it really is. OK, thank you. Great. Um, our next question is from Morgan. Hi. Um, Hi. What did you find most challenging in school? What did I find most challenging in school? Well, when I, when I, uh, when I failed uh, my 11 plus, which was the transfer test between primary school and big school, I don't know what it's called now, right? What is it called now? It's just transfer test. Transfer yeah. test, all right. It was 11 plus in my day. Um, I, was, I was sent to Inst in the center of town, which was a grammar school. Yeah. And I didn't want to go there because all my mates were going to the boys' model and they wore white socks in the boys' model and Inst wore black socks and I was not going somewhere <laughs> that wore black socks, right? Um, and, and my hair was tipped and I was, a, I was a, 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 a rough kid that wasn't going to any school where you know, people from the little road went. Um, and it was scary getting into that school. It was just scary getting in because again, it was that sense of, are they better than me? I quickly realized that none of us are better than each other. And so the, the, the fright disappeared after a couple of weeks to the point where some of the kids in, in, in Inst were wanting to get their hair tipped and I was being a bad influence on them. Brilliant, so our next question is from Gabrielle. Hello, Hello. hiya. <laughs> I was just wondering, how do you deal with difficult interviewees? I deal with difficult, I talk to politicians every day. I deal with difficult interviewees every day. Um, how do I deal with them? Well, look, a lot of my job is, is, as I say, interviewing politicians, right? My job is just to get them to tell the truth. My job is to get them to answer a question. To be, to be quite frank, it's quite enjoyable when they don't answer a question because it just gives me uh, more room to keep on going until they do. So it becomes, uh, 
it becomes a little bit of a battle every time they're trying to avoid a question and I, I'm trying to get, get them to, to, to answer it. Um, on the other side of that, so that's politics, then on the other side of, of, of interviews that I do, you know, you're reminded of the sense of responsibility you have when you're doing a job like mine, when someone contacts you and they say they're suicidal, because it's not, it's not just the stuff on air that you hear. So I would get people contacting me because they see me on telly, they hear me on the radio, and they would say, help. And when someone asks you for that help, that's a huge responsibility and that's difficult because you don't know them and you want to help them. And that sense, and I want, and I do help them, but it's a huge responsibility. Okay. Great. So our next question is from Paige, just over here. Hello, Paige. Hiya. Hiya. What advice would you give to someone interested in a career in journalism? Someone interested in a career in journalism. Torture them. Torture, torture people like me. Torture people like the BBC, um, to get a foot in the door. All right, so lots of people are interested in careers in journalism. So what you've got to think is, how do you stand out from the crowd? Because you think about it, the BBC, and there are other, obviously, there's ITV, journalism's also newspapers, fantastic newspapers in Northern Ireland, the Telegraph, the Irish News, the Newsletter, the Daily Mirror, and so goes on. So the big, big secret is getting in the door of one of those organisations, because it's the same in life. If you're in the door and you know someone, or you, they know who you are, then if you're ever a plan, plan for a job, you're just not another name on a sheet. They know who you are. So my advice would be to do something different. These days you've all got recorders on your mobile phones. You've got, you've got a, a capacity to shoot video on your mobile phone or, or record audio. So rather than just being someone that writes to the BBC or any of these other organizations and says, I want to be in journalism, how different would it be if you were saying, I so want to be in journalism that I have recorded this story. Have a listen to it. I have shot this little video on my phone. Have a listen to it. Now that would set you apart from the rest. And the, and the other point is this, you have got so many stories in your generation, in your age group, that people like me can't do. I can't do what you could do. I can't relate as closely to your friends as you can. So if you really want to be in journalism, then put together a story. And you see, if I don't return your call, ring the next day, ring BBC reception. And you see, if they fob you off, get your parents' advice and go down stand reception and say to the, say to the BBC, they'll not like me saying this, by the way, and, and, and say to the BBC, I'm sorry, I heard what Stephen said on that, on that stage. So I'm here and I want to make it. That would be my advice. Thank you. That's good advice. So our next question is from Lewis. I'd probably get sacked now tomorrow morning for saying that. <laughs> um, does Hi, being Lewis. a well-known broadcaster give you power? Say that again, sorry? Does being a well-known broadcaster give you power? Well, so there's a, there is a perception of me, okay? And the perception of me, because of the job I do, would be that I'm cocky and that I'm arrogant and I'm whatever it is, okay? So the reality is, I'm trying to hold down a job like everybody else. That's the bottom line. So the BBC might decide next week, next year, whatever, that there's someone better than me to do the job I'm doing and they might replace me. So first of all, I don't consider myself to be a powerful person, all right? In, in, to this extent, I, I am no better than anybody else. And I think that that's what's maybe helped some of my broadcasting, that when people contact me, there's not one inch of me thinks is looking at them or their story from up high. Indeed, quite a lot of the times I'm listening to people and I'm admiring them and I'm comparing my failures to their successes. Okay? That's one side of it. To take the, to take the other interpretation of power, um, I've got the biggest radio show in Northern Ireland. Okay? The most listened to radio show by far. The honest answer is that gives me a, 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 a tremendous amount of power. Um, and you've got to use it responsibly. And that's where the problem comes. Because I'm just aware that when someone contacts me, how am I using that power? Because I can affect their lives. 
some of the proudest moments are some of the smallest stories. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. There was, a, there was a lady who contacted me maybe three, four years ago, and she, she uh, had been going to visit her husband's grade, grave um, every week. But the council um, changed and Translink, or whoever it was, I don't even know if it was Translink, but someone changed the bus route without consulting the local community. And that meant that she couldn't get to her husband's grave. Well, I used every bit of power I had to get that bus route back on, and it was back on, and she could visit her husband's grave. That's power, but that's not power for me. That's kind of power for that program. The one other example I'll give you was a woman called Jean Faulkner. Jean Faulkner was in her late 80s. She was in a care home, and the government of Northern Ireland decided that they were going to change all the policies around care homes, which meant she was going to be moved out of her care home, out of her nursing home. And the government had consulted with families and they had consulted with themselves and all their experts in their grey suits. Do you know what they hadn't done? They hadn't consulted with Jean. They hadn't consulted with those elderly people. So I went ballistic on the radio. And I went down and I visited Jean. Jean got to stay in her care home. That's power, but it's power that the programme has rather than me. Great. So our next question is from Ben. And if I'm waffling too much, tell me. Don't be afraid to. <laughs> Where's Ben? Just uh, Ben up here. No, Ben's on there. Oh, no, there, there he is down there. Hiya, Ben. Where are you? <laughs> there you are. There Go he ben. is there. He's got a What other jobs would you like to do using your skills as a broadcaster? Actually, I always wanted, when I was in school, I always wanted to be a teacher. I think teachers do incredible jobs. Um, because they can affect how you think about yourselves. They can, I, I, I still want to be a teacher. When this all ends for me, and it could end at any stage, I would love to go back to school and, and teach media studies, because that's, that's what I know. So I think I'd be all right at it. Um, I just think, I think teaching in Northern Ireland is undervalued. I think, I, well, you know, because you're in school now, you know the difference between a good and bad teacher. You know the difference between a teacher that really cares, that can inspire you at whatever it is, sport or a subject, or just how you feel about yourself. And I would love to do that. I'd love to, I'd love to be able to interact with any of you on a longer term basis if I was a teacher, especially those of you who think I'm not good enough because of some reason, and get it through to you that, you see, when you get older, you realize that we're all kind of the same in terms of, this is going to sound so slushy, but I believe in it. We're, we're all kind of human beings and, 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 and success in life, as I said before, is contentment more than anything else. And a teacher can give that to you. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's the answer. What subject would you teach? What subject? I'd love yeah. to teach media studies. I'd, just, I'd, I'd love to do that because... I think I'd be qualified enough at, at doing that, <laughs> what I've experienced. Um, and I, I genuinely think maybe, maybe I will. Let's see yeah. when the BBC gets rid of me. <laughs> so our next question is from Sophie. Hello, Sophie. Hi, yeah. Um, obviously, it was World Health Day. Her, <clears throat> sorry. World Mental Health Day this week. How do you manage your stresses and demands of your busy schedule? Well, that's, that's probably one of the best questions for me personally. Um, that, that has been asked. Um, it's not planted by a journalist, is it? <laughs> um, so in my, in, my, in my early working life, I didn't manage it well enough to my detriment, okay? So, you know, uh, what I did up until a few years ago was I worked around the clock and I didn't take any breaks whatsoever. Literally, and this is a fact, that the BBC had to force me out of the building a number of years ago. And I remember it. They forced me out of the building because I wouldn't take time off because I was obsessed with all the programmes and I was in there at 9 or 10 at night and I was moving on to the next job and, and, and the next job. Um, I learned that that's not healthy. And I think your generation realises that as well as your physical health, your mental health is so important. And I learned the hard way, because what happened to me was I got to the stage where I was so tired that 
I was trying to concentrate on things and I just couldn't. It just was not, it wasn't registering as well as, well as it should. So here's what I now do. So I work seven days a week, which is too much. I work around the clock seven days a week. Um, I do Monday to Friday for Radio Ulster. I then do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for Five Live. As soon as this finishes, I'm on a plane over to, to England to do that tonight. So I'm working at the beginning of the day and I'm working late at night. I'm also doing uh, Nolan Live. I don't know if any of you have seen that, late night uh, television show. It's on 18 times a year. I have a production company that's making quite a few programs and, and documentaries. So Monday to Sunday, I am flat out. What, what have I learned? So what do I now do over the last five years? And I'm lucky enough to do this, and I, and I acknowledge that. In order to protect my mental health, um, I take a solid month off, and I go over to America, to a place called Santa Monica in Los Angeles, and my soul calms down. And, and I don't work, and that's for a month then. And then what I do at other pockets of the year is I take breaks off, and those breaks I take off for one reason only, my mental health. So I stop, and that's so important. And I think your generation gets that. There's nothing to be embarrassed about looking after your brain as well as your body. There's nothing to, embarrassing about saying, I'm too stressed, I need to talk to somebody. Um, and I learned that later in life. Make sure you know it now, because it's very important. And there must, be, <clears throat> there must be a lot of stress being in the public eye as well. How do you deal with like, personal criticism directed at you? How do I deal with personal criticism? Mm. It, it, it's, it's, it's fine the majority of the time. Um, and it's irritating sometimes, right? Mm. So, you know, if people... Peop, peop, you know, because, mobile, because everybody has a mobile phone now, uh, for some strange, unknown reason, people want selfies with anybody that's on TV. So anytime I go out, people ask for selfies. And I guess my self-confidence is at a stage where I kind of think to myself, well, that's okay, but why do you really want a picture of me? Like, what are you going to do with it, right? So that's fine. That's slightly irritating when you're with your mother. So it's okay when I'm with my own, but there was a guy last week, for example, and my mum's not well at the minute, and I took her out for the day, and he turned his phone on and started filming my mother without my permission. And so what I did was I got my phone out and I started filming him without his permission, um, and he didn't like it. Um, the, other, the only other instance I can think of where I just thought it crossed the line was I was sitting in the city airport, ready to go over to England to work, and this woman came over, and I was eating my dinner in the city airport, and, and she lifted the plate off the table and she said, you're too fat to eat that. And she, and she put the, 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 the plate on another table. Now, had I have said anything to her that day, that would have been a story and I would have been depicted as whatever. So I was busting to say something to her because she wasn't the skinniest herself, um, but I didn't. But the vast majority of the time, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we've got time for one more quick question and that's from Jason. Hello, Jason. Hello. Hello. What is the most significant issue you have challenged or championed? We do so much. Like we do, like I'm doing, you know, 300 odd shows a year, all year down for decades. What's the most significant issue? If I can answer it in a broader way, because I want it to be a genuine answer, okay? There's a certain section of well-connected people in Northern Ireland who don't actually want working class people to be too powerful or to have too powerful a voice, all right? What do I mean by that, just to explain that slightly more? You know, I, I do experience well-connected people in positions of power who say to me, I'll talk to you on the radio but I won't talk to any of your callers. And I say, I'm sorry? Oh, well, because you know they, they aren't very well educated or they're this or they're that or the other thing. I detest that to my core. And so therefore, to, to answer your question, I think one of the most powerful things that 
I'm trying to do as an individual is I am trying, I'm doing well out of it and I'm earning a good living out of it and I get all that, okay? But I am trying, if I can look back in my career and, and to those people in power who, if they have any snobbery about them towards working class people, if I have eroded even 10% of that snobbery or I've taken it on or I've empowered more working class people to be heard, then that's job done. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So that's all we have time for for this Super Assembly. Today's programme will be available to watch this evening on the Make It website, along with lots of other resources um, to help you in the world of work and to help you be the best you can be. So visit bbc.co.uk slash make it. Thank you very much to all the pupils, staff and teachers here at Abbey Community College for hosting us. And of course, to Stephen Nolan. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.